Welcome to the Pretty Powerful Podcast, where powerful women are interviewed every week to share real inspiring stories and incredible insight to help women or anyone break the barriers, be a part of innovation, shatter the glass ceiling, and dominate to the top of their sport, industry, or life's mission. Join us as we celebrate exceptional women and step into our power. And now, here's your host, Angela Gennari. Hello, and thank you for joining me for another episode of the Pretty Powerful Podcast. My name is Angela Gennari, and today I am here with JJ DeGeronimo. How are you? Oh my goodness, so great. So glad to get together. Glad yes, you're, I love that you're in Atlanta. That's like my happy place. Yes, I love it. It's it's uh, and we're having the most amazing week of weather too. So it's like just cool enough to kind of be considered fall, so, <laughs> but also warm enough to wear shorts. So, um, well, thank you so much for joining me today. I know you're super busy and you've got such an amazing resume. So I want to kind of introduce you to our audience. So, um, JJ DeGeronimo wrote Seeking. 74 key findings to raising your energy, sidestep your self-doubts, and align with your life's work because she wanted to share the strategies that helped her infuse more purpose and meaning into her work and life. The book is filled with short chapters, relevant stories, and specific questions that help readers evaluate their choices, dig through their stories, embrace their gifts, and elevate their energy. Very cool. So exciting. Okay, so I am a big believer in, um, you know, what goes through your mind is what comes out in your work, right? So mindfulness about how you work and, you know, what you're putting your passions into and how you're directing your energy. I think that's so important. So I love that you've written an entire book kind of along those lines of, you know, aligning your, your energy and your passions with your life's work. Yeah, it's well, it's not my first book. I'll say okay. it took me a long time to get there. You know, my first book was about having kids and being like in a time in my career where I had to hit it so hard, but I had such young kids at home. Yeah. I lost my way through my choices. And mm. I feel like that book is really for young moms that still have such a passion to be productive in the workforce. And it's challenging. You know, I don't think anyone gives you the cliff notes of how to make that work. And so that's the working woman's GPS when the plan to have it all lead you astray. Mm -hmm. And when I took that on the road and started talking to women's groups and ERGs, you know, a lot of women are like, how do I get promoted? How do I get to a VP level? How do I get on a board? Yeah. Why am I not getting the yeses I thought I was, you know, mm -hmm. that I got so early on in my career. And so that was really accelerate your impact. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was amazing because it really made me do the research of why so many women are middle management mm -hmm. and giving those tools and techniques to people is so awesome. And then, you know, this, the third book was really the book about me and like, okay, I have all these accolades. I thought by this point I would feel so good. And I would really be at a point where things are like flourishing in a way that made me believe I was like in my flow, in my yeah. life's work. And it was quite the opposite. I had to really, I mean, all, all these things kept falling apart, right? In yeah, my life, yeah. I thought we we're going to manifest in it where I was, wasn't working. My family, I had issues, you know, my dad was sick. And I think it was really just like those tower cards that are like, all right, you need to regroup and really figure out who you are. And that's when I really learned about the mind and the mind chatter and the alignment of energy and kind of sidestepping that self-doubt, which is what so many women are dealing with uh, yes. that are keeping them in a holding pattern. Yeah. Oh my God. This is, yeah. I want to deep dive into this because this is so, so fascinating because I talk about this all the time and you're right. I mean, we have a real hard challenge getting past middle management as women, especially once we have children, because I think it's not just the perception of our employers, you know, and, and, and the people that we work with that feel like we can't take on more work. It's our own guilt and our own need to feel like we need to excel in every aspect of life. And when you are spreading yourself so thin, you know, you're committing, you know, a lot to work, a lot to your children, a lot to the school, a lot to the activities, the sports, the, you know, there's so many things are being pulled in so many directions. And the higher we climb in our career, the more commitment there is to that. And so we feel like there, there's a, a balance. Uh, lack right so we feel like we can't get we can't get there so 
tell me in your your first book how you how you talked about getting through that well it's interesting because it's a chart that i have used to this day even did a keynote last monday and i still shared yeah. this chart because i had interviewed so many successful people and so many said like mind your calendar mm -hmm. mind things that matter to you only say yes to things you want to. And I'm like, how does that work? That sounds yeah. like so high in the sky. Like I need <laughs> as an engineering mind, you know, I need like a real chart. Right. And so I ended up creating charts at the end of putting my book together. And this chart called the power of no was really the chart that kind of has really stood the test of time. And so it's a six column chart. You can download it for free. I'll give you guys the link. You can, I just share it anybody who wants it. Cause it's been such a game changer for me. But it's a six column chart and you list out the commitments you've already said yes to who asked you to do that commitment mm. because a lot of us have repeat offenders some of them are family members some are co-workers some yeah. are partners does it align to where you are right now or where you want to have impact next and it's just a yes no because many of us say yes because we think we should we feel guilty we want to be liked we want to be helpful we just right. want to be the person that people go to so that third column is, does it align to where you are or where you want to impact next? Yes or no. Mm -hmm. Fourth column, does it give you good energy? Does it give you good energy? Do you enjoy that work? Like I do not enjoy doing certain things. And like, I'm really yeah. mindful now that if I get an ask to do something like, uh, you know, I'm not a great panelist. It's just not my thing. So let's use that as an example. Like if someone asked me to be on the panel, I'm like, ah, that's just not a fit for me. You know, I have so much research I've done. I just want to give the nuggets every time. And I can only do like a minute, 30 seconds. And so I just don't say yes to panel work anymore. Like, can you be on the panel? Nope, that's not a good fit for me. You know, yeah, yeah, I'll help yeah. you speak. I'll be a moderator but uh, of the panel, but I'm not really great as a panelist. And so really knowing what gives you good energy and what doesn't. Mm -hmm. And then how much time does it take? Because we get asked almost the same for a 10 minute activity or a 10 hour activity. And so you really got to say, can I fit this amount of time into my schedule? And I have a lot of great asks as we probably you do to mentor women entrepreneurs and women in business and, you know, getting out and having coffee and doing all these things. It sounds great, but when you get into your schedule, it's like two, three, four hours a day. Mm -hmm. We've got all these other things. Like, can we make it a zoom? Can we do a group call? Like, how can you rephrase the ask to meet the amount of time that you actually have to give something, especially if it gives you good energy and aligns with something that's important to you. And then right. the last columns remove. And that has actually been carried through in a lot of my books and a lot of my work because you cannot raise your impact. You cannot have more influence with the same schedule. You have to clean your schedule out at some level to create paths for relevance for where you want to have impact next. And if you don't kind of mind your schedule or clean out your schedule at some level, there's no space. Mm -hmm. And for many people listening, you know, you, a lot of us women are working 8, 10, 12, 14, 16 hours a day. Mm -hmm. You need to have momentum to jump into what is important for you next, but you can't do that just hoping that it happens. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And you can't have the expectation because this was me for many years. I would always say it'll get better when I'll have more time when, you know, and, and so I kept kind of thinking that, you know, if I just get through this grind, it'll get easier and it never gets easier because the more you say yes, and the more you take on and, you know, if things are going the way you, you hope they are, then it's snowballing into bigger opportunities and more advancement. So things don't get easier and you have to stop lying to yourself and thinking that they will. Yeah. And, you know, now I'm just really kind of mindful. Like I'm in the moment when someone's asking me, can you just, or would you, or, mm -hmm. you know, we'd love for you to do this. I make sure that I can feel my toes. So I wiggle my toes because I want to be like in the moment for asks now, because yeah. I want to make sure I'm really knowing what I'm saying yes to and it's not that I don't want to help a lot of people, but I know I'm more powerful when I'm in my zone, when I'm saying yes to things that are really uh, light me up. Mm -hmm. And my whole schedule can't be all positive, but I want more in my schedule to be positive than not be positive. And I think for many of us, that doesn't always happen because we say yes so, so quickly. Right. No, absolutely. Or how, why do you think we're saying yes to so many things? Do you think it's guilt? Do you think it's obligation? What do you think we're saying yes to? 
I sometimes we're just so busy. We're like, yeah, yeah, sure. I can do that. Sure. Yeah. Fine. Just put on my schedule, send me an email, whatever. Um, sometimes it's guilt, right? I want mm-hmm. them to like me. I want them as a working mother, you know how hard it is in the community to feel like the other, like all the moms accept, accept you and you yeah. want to create some good camaraderie for your kids. And, you know, so there's that, but then you also have organizations you're part of, maybe churches or nonprofits or something where they're like, you know, we're putting this event together. Could you just, and so, you know, I've learned that I'm not really good to going to all these, you know, nonprofit meetings for an event. So yeah. I try to find a project that I can work on individually so that I can do it within the time that I can set for it. So because I come from a tech industry, like setting up Square, setting up online payments, setting up bank yeah. accounts to accept money, that's a super easy thing for me to do. And mm-hmm. it's super helpful because a lot of people don't know or didn't, you know, know how to do that as easily. And so I try to take projects that I can work within my time frame, work with the gifts I have and contribute the way I want to contribute rather than sitting in 10, 10, you know, 10, two hour meetings for a nonprofit event. I can't give 20 hours to an event to just sit there for, you know, the 30 seconds or three minutes that is pertinent to the project I'm working on. I don't have that kind of time. Yeah. Yeah. And what I've noticed, like when I was trying to volunteer for like my son's school, everything happens during the day. And so, you know, I would, when I got asked to do volunteer work, like, oh, we have PTA meetings every Tuesday at 10 o'clock. And I'm like, well, I also have a management meeting every 10, you know, Tuesday at 10 o'clock. So that's not going to work for me, but, you know, give me a project that I can do on an evening or a weekend and I'm happy to contribute, but I'm not going to show up at your, you know, weekday, you know, during work office hours meetings, you know, it's just not it's up, something I can't fit into my schedule, but, but happy to take on another project, you know, on a, yeah. on a specific level. And don't be afraid to create your own project. So like one of the things with yeah. my kids, they're all, they're a teenager and beyond now, but like, I just created my own event. So yeah. I had the bubble lady come when they were in middle and not, you know, kindergarten and stuff where she did yeah. these huge bubbles you could get in like I can call her I can pay her I can set up the time I can communicate with the teachers and then I set up an right. event so I'm not right. having like these six meetings for an event of something I can set up in 60 minutes mm-hmm. and so I think for many of us listening like just if you want to contribute find a way that makes sense for you Yeah. Yeah. I always say, do what you can with what you have. Right. Because we don't always have a lot of time, but you know, I, I, I might have resources, right. So I might have resources I can contribute. I don't have time, but I can contribute resources, whether that's introductions or, you know, vendors that I've used in the past that might be able to do a favor for something, you know, that that's something I can contribute. So. Um, so you talk a little bit about, um, what women should know after 35. So tell me a little bit about that. I'm curious about that as somebody who's over 35. Well, you know, the promotions generally come easier under 35 and then you get to yeah. be like around 35 and there's not as many jobs, um, yeah. to move into. And it's kind of interesting because if you watch the tea leaves of who gets promoted, they're usually connected. They're usually, you know, there's something, there's other connections happening. And so uh, I wasn't really planning to write another book, but I was mm-hmm. asked by a lot of women, like, how do I get promoted? How do I find a sponsor? How do I get on a board? And I was like, you know, those are great questions. Cause I, I had some of those things, but I didn't have them all. And I realized as we talked about earlier, there's so many women, but how do they kind of push through to that next level? Mm-hmm. And what I found is that there is a true difference of working in your career and on your career. And most women do an absolutely fabulous job in their career. They go above and beyond. They deliver great results, oftentimes under budget, you know, under timelines. They're Mm. great collaborators, but we need to be working on our career. And on our career is kind of letting people know what you are working on. Mm. Figure out the metrics and accomplishments based on numbers of how you've moved the needle, how you've moved things forward, making sure you have key relationships, not just mentors. 89% of women only have mentors. Mm -hmm. Mentors are people that give you advice when you're with them, but when the meeting's over, it's done. Women have to actually have sponsors. Sponsors are people that use their social capital to help you. So Mm. they're sending an email. They're pushing you into a meeting you weren't invited to. They're giving you access. They're making a call when you're interested in getting onto something. So once you submit your resume, they're following up with a call for you. So there's a lot of things that women have to do. And research shows that 
most women are lacking visibility, sponsorship, PL experience, and headcount. Interesting. Okay. So I love the idea of mentors versus sponsors because, you know, looking back, I would have called people mentors who really were sponsors. And, and as an entrepreneur, most of my life, it's been, you know, I've always looked at it as mentors because I think of sponsors as being corporate, but they're not always corporate, are they? So I've had sponsors who have made phone calls on my behalf to get me funding when I've gone to 10 different banks and got no's the whole time, you know, and then they were able to make a phone call and and get that funding for me. Or, you know, whether it's, um, you know, getting an introduction into uh, a client that I've been trying to to meet with forever and ever and ever and haven't been able to get any traction and they use their position, you know, their their associations with this this client to get me that meeting. So that that also applies, doesn't it? All of that applies. Yes. And you see, they use their social capital to help you. Mm -hmm. And so they have to know you, they have to trust you. They have to know that you deliver value. You know, you're not just finding people off the street and saying, Hey, can you make that call for me? You're leveraging relationships of people who know you in the workplace. Right. So how can we be better sponsors? So as women with other women coming up through the workforce, how can we then contribute and and help those who are coming up? Because I always see all these, hey, we're looking for more mentors. We're looking for people to mentor the younger, you know, generation coming into the workforce. But should we really be saying, I'd like to sponsor? Yes, I like to sponsor, but sponsorship is not like like an artificial, like you can't just partner with someone and sponsor. What right. I think is often helpful is if you know people that are trying to make that next step in their career, what asking them, what are things that you need to get done, mm-hmm. right? Do you need a testimonial? Do you need a reference? Do you need to me to open a door that I have? And I think it's kind of like, it has to be with people that you already know because you're not going to leverage your own social capital with strangers. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. You have to trust them, especially because your reputation's on the line the moment you make that phone call or make that introduction. So, right. And so many women that I talk to are like, oh, I don't have a LinkedIn profile or I don't really mm-hmm. pay attention to that. It's an easy way to capture testimonials. So if you're yeah. even doing project work or consulting work, always sending someone, Hey, can you just write a sentence or two? Or if you want, I'll get it started for you. And you can send a couple sentences to them. They usually tweak it and then they can post it because even when I was in corporate America, people would ask me for references or if I was trying to, and I would just literally screenshot my references on LinkedIn. And then I didn't have to like personally call everyone, but can you, can you, can they have a phone call with you? Can they do Mm -hmm. this? And you'll see on my LinkedIn, I have like 20 something references because I just use them in so many ways to speed up that. Yes. Okay. I like that. I like a lot. So, so we talk, you talk a lot about mindfulness in your, in your career and in your business. How did you come to value mindfulness as part of your strategy? Kicking in screaming. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. To be totally honest, like I am a type A personality. I pride myself on getting things done, which means I'm always planning, always strategizing, always in the future or reflecting on what I could have done better. And so when I was having sort of that meltdown, I mentioned, I just visited a couple different people and many of them pointed me to mindfulness training. And I just thought it was mm-hmm. so ridiculous. I was like, right. that sounds just dumb. I'm not doing that. Right. But some of the people were pretty firm about me going. And I ended up in an eight week John Kabat-Zinn course taught locally in my town. And I was not a good student the first two classes, for sure. I brought my notebook, my coffee. I'm like, let me do my grocery list. Let me figure (laughs) out what I'm going to do for the week. And then my teacher, of course, was like, can we leave the notebook in the car? I'm like, nope. No, we cannot. No, we cannot. I'm a high producer. I'm a high. And that's how I branded myself. Like, I get stuff done. And so just sitting there to be and learning to be mindful of your thoughts seemed like ridiculous. Uh, but thank goodness there were eight classes because by class three, four, five, I was like, oh my goodness, look at all the things I say to myself. And then by mm. class seven, I was like, oh my, like I had no idea that how I talked to myself was really impacting my decisions and my fear and my self-doubt. And I think for me, mindfulness was really a tool that has changed my life. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, I try and I say, oh, I I am very mindful, but it wasn't until I really started making it a practice every day. You know, I started meditating in the morning and I, you know, before I go to sleep at night, instead of watching TV, you know, to make myself tired, I listen to a meditation and, you know, you really start kind of going inward and figuring out exactly what it is that you want and exactly, you know, how you're going to get from A to B. And, you know, we have the answers within us most of the time. We just have to discover what they are. Well, that's a perfect tee up for the third book, because I really went on my own like adventure to figure out who I was and why I was really on the planet because I was so used to delivering and being, I was so in the masculine energy. We Mm -hmm. don't have feminine masculine energy. I was like 90% masculine energy. And the real work that I've had to do is soften myself and go inside and figure out why I doubted myself, why I was challenged, you know, what are the gifts that I have? And that took me years. And I visited many energy practitioners just off the side of my desk. I still worked full time, but I really talk about the work I had to do around my relationship with money. So, you know, the insights I got from my parents and the relationships I picked throughout my life how I overcame perfectionism. Like Mm -hmm. there were all these things that I really had to work through to get where I am right now. And I really feel at this point, I'm much more in my flow and my work is so much more powerful. Really? So how do you feel like that made the biggest impact for you? Which part, the mindfulness or just the mindfulness? Mm Mm-hmm. Well, the mindfulness helped me understand the stories I had to work through. And so when you're making a decision or things aren't going your way or anything happens in your life, like just pausing for a second and just understanding how you're talking to yourself and Mm -hmm. what you're saying, because oftentimes we set up these stories from a long time ago, decades and decades ago, that then put us into autopilot. And I feel like if you want to shift where you are or what you're working on, you have to change the inside first. Mm -hmm. And so the real essence of my third book seeking is working from the inside out, because I've been taught my whole life to work from the outside in. Like once I got there on the outside, I'd feel really good on the inside. And as you know, like that doesn't happen. You just get busier and you work harder and you do more things, but it doesn't Mm -hmm. really bring you I think the joy so many women think they're going to experience or the Mm self-love. And I really had to change my trajectory to spend more time figuring out what was happening and why I was driving so hard because Mm -hmm. the driving was really running, right? And the stretching and striving was really to fill fill my my self-love bucket. And so when I moved to being an entrepreneur, a lot of that stuff kind of faded away. Mm -hmm. The titles, the salary, the accolades, the awards, like I got some, but not like I did when I was working. And so I kind of was left like, who am I? Right, right. It's hard. Yeah. Because you don't have anyone out there giving you that recognition for what you're doing anymore, right? Like you're on your own. You, You have to pat yourself on the back. And it's hard because like, even with me, the more successful I've become, the more imposter syndrome has haunted me and the more, you know, doubts have crept up, even though I'm achieving the things that I want to achieve, I'm more doubtful that it's sustained. I'm like, I don't know if I can keep this up. I don't know if this is accurate. I don't know if I'm believing this, you know? And so you really start, it's, it's this little doubt in your mind that just will not go away. And the thing that I talk a lot about in the book is too, is like frequency is like, we are all energy. And so like really Mm -hmm. understanding where you are in your frequency chart, I kind of align it to radio stations because FM is frequency modulation. So Mm -hmm. are you at 90.2? Are you at a 95? Are you in a 98 or 102? It doesn't matter where you are. You're not measuring yourself. You're just Mm -hmm. like, let me just see where I'm at. I'm like, how do I get that higher? How do I raise that energy? Because what I've been working on even the last four years is keeping my energy high at work, meaning I'm aligning to the right work. I'm being kind to myself on the inside, right? Mm -hmm. I'm talking about things that inspire me. I'm really kind of dodging these nonsense conversations that are just like, I just, I don't have a place for that. I'm really mining 
my frequency. Because if I get on calls or in situations that are really negative, it takes me a long time to pull that back up. Yes. And one of the key strategies that I use is gratitude. Like, I'm so grateful to be with you right now. This is amazing. We get to have this conversation as women. How many women would love to have this conversation? Yeah. Yeah. And I feel like the gratitude for me is what keeps my energy high and it keeps me out of that self-doubt. Yeah, absolutely. So in addition to being an award-winning author, you're also a light worker. So what does that mean exactly? Hmm. So light workers often have to figure out how to illuminate from within. And then once they learn how to shine their light right on themselves, they can shine it for others. And for me, I've been really working to help illuminate the path for others by sharing not only the work that I'm doing from the inside out, mm -hmm. but many practitioners I've worked with. And so I've interviewed several practitioners that I've worked with over the last five years to share them as tools and strategies for women, because I believe that this is how women are going to help women. They're yeah. going to help us sidestep that doubt, align with our light, get into our flow. And I've talked with, oh my goodness, probably 150 practitioners. And so now I started interviewing all those practitioners to show them that most of these women have done it off the side of their desk while they had some kind of job. And eventually yeah. they moved into offering these ancient practices and healing modalities. And there's just a whole wealth of knowledge that gives women permission to not more back into the feminine because mm -hmm. we go to work every day so heavily in the masculine we leave half of our toolkit on the side of the road and like how do we figure out how to integrate both the feminine and masculine both in our lives and at work so that we can really create a more engaging but more like nourishing experience for us rather than being so depleted as so many people are so what does it look like when you say stepping in, stepping into your feminine? Because I, I carry a lot of masculine energy too, as a single mom, I take care of everything in the house as a business owner. I've got a lot of people that depend on me. And so I feel like I'm constantly on this masculine energy side. Mm -hmm. So what does it mean to step into your feminine energy? So your, your feminine energy, like the masculine is the doer. Mm -hmm. the creator, the right. activator, the achiever, right? Which mm -hmm. many of us are in. Right. To lean into the feminine. It's like the knowing, the whispers, mm -hmm. the connection to mother nature. Mm -hmm. And I think for many of us, we have to get used to putting that into our schedule. So a lot of people will say, oh, well, I'm into self-care. So they'll go get a massage. And I'm always like, right. why not do acupuncture? Why not do a cold plunge or do work on your nervous system? Like, it's great for people to rub you down and feel good. But like, why not work on your nervous system? Because our nervous system is the thing for most women that really has to be pulled down and, and grounded because we're mm. so in hyper speed and we're burning ourselves out from the inside out. Many of us get sick and things happen. And so like really getting more into nature. And if that means just going outside and walking in the grass or touching a tree while yeah. you're on a conference call or just being, you know, I take my kids to all types of classes. I do a lot of stuff here. I do drumming and I, I do energy classes. I take my kids to a lot of the energy practitioners I go to. I don't care if they do it or not. It's just like something I love to do. And I want to integrate my family into it. My husband doesn't come to as much, but I bring my kids to all kinds of things and I host mm. retreats and I bring a lot of energy practices into the retreats because I feel like women are going to do fine in business ultimately, yes. but they've got to really settle their mm. engine on the inside so that they can tap into their knowing and wisdom and get more into their flow. So they're not living so outside their body all the time. Mm -hmm. What do you think about, so I'm curious to know your thoughts on this idea. You know, there was a book written about um, how to do business like a man. I'm curious to know your thoughts on that. I mean, are we all doing business like a man? I, don't, I hope not. <laughs> right. I mean, at some level, we have business is all is whether you're male or female, we all have masculine and feminine uh -huh. energy. Yeah, I would say the majority of business and government and leadership is men, right? Mm -hmm. And in my opinion, it's not going so great. Not right? going so good, right? <laughs> we need more collaboration, mm -hmm. more connection, more understanding, more yeah. openness. Yeah. You know, it's not all about money. It's just mm -hmm. not. 
Mm -hmm. And like the and fact that society has made us believe that's the only coin we're chasing yeah. is an injustice to ourselves and our children. A hundred percent agree with you. I, that, that book just irritates me because it just, it to me is saying as women, we can only succeed if we act like a man. And that's so counterintuitive to everything that I believe. I believe that what we bring to the table is the opposite and it's equally as effective, if not more so in the boardroom and business, because you're right, collaboration, uh, connection, community, the bigger picture thinking, the, the depth of thinking, all of these things are what we bring to the table as women. Women. And I think that that is what makes a company strong. And when you're only looking at the bottom line, you're only thinking about domination and finance and, you know, that is not, that is not how business is sustainable. I think that's how you might dominate, but it might not be, you know, the, the most, um, may not be the best path for most businesses. Definitely not. I mean, when you see the research that when boards have diversity, mm -hmm. gender diversity, ethnic diversity, they do better as a company. I mean, how much yeah. more research do you need? Yeah, exactly. A hundred percent. Yeah. So I, you know, I tell my son all the time because he, he's a, he's a, he's a little entrepreneur. He's 16 years old and he owns his own business, but you know, I tell him all the time, um, you know, when he talks about building his business, I, I always tell him align with your competitors because collaboration happens at the top. Competition happens at the bottom. You know, the, the competition, the ones who are cutthroat, those are the bottom players. Those are the bottom feeders. We don't want them. You know, we want to collaborate, which means we're dealing with the people who are working at a higher level, who are more community minded, who are more collaboration focused. That's how you get farther in business. And I think this is going to continue to happen and happen and happen. I can't tell you how many calls I get from companies that want to hire more women salespeople. And I ask them yeah, why. Yeah. Well, they're better lists generally. generally. Yeah. And this is not too bad. When you, le you leverage the feminine energy, you're more better listener. Oftentimes you're more empathetic. You're mm -hmm. more interested in a common joint goal. And yeah. it's no accident they're calling asking for more women to mm -hmm. do that work. Mm -hmm. And it's so funny because the U.S. women like, oh, I could never do that. Why can't you do that? Well, I've never done it before. Yeah. What if I fail? Well, you might fail and failing yeah. is good. And collecting mm -hmm. no's is also good. Mm -hmm. I just think if you're listening right now and you're sitting on the edge of the pool thinking, should I, could I, would I? Mm -hmm. yes, say yes yourself. Just check it out. I always say Jen Sincero just says, let me see what I can do. You don't have to have it all figured out. In fact, I would say if you have a vision for where you want to go, and you believe you can achieve it, you do not have to worry about the how. The universe swoops in to get it done. And this, mm -hmm. you know, my books, I'm dyslexic, so writing a book seems almost impossible, but I have three mm -hmm. award-winning books. That's so awesome. if I can do it, you can do it. Absolutely. So that's a great segue into asking, how do you define your life's work? Hmm. You know, my life's work is still unfolding for me. Yeah. I feel like I'm really leaning into what is calling me mm -hmm. and uh, I get these whispers. So in 2008, I got a whisper to bring women together, which yeah. is how I started Tech Savvy Women. In 2016, I got a whisper to bring women together outside, which is how I started my retreats. Now I have a whisper to bring the mystics together, which is how I started my community. So I feel like I'm evolving Mm -hmm. uh, I'm an evolving soul that's really listening to the guidance and then figuring out, okay, if I'm going to do this, how am I going to get this off the ground? And my journey for this particular work has been 15 years. So it's not 15 months or 15 days. It's been a journey. And most of it has happened off the side of my desk. Yeah. Well, and I love that you started in tech, which is so different than light work, right? So, yeah. you know, you, you come from one completely side of the one complete different side of the industry and you've really transitioned through and with a complete understanding of everything in between. So that's, that's really amazing. Yeah. So tell me who inspires you. Oh my goodness. I have so many people. I mean, I'm an Audible's listener and I have mm. hundreds of books. If you follow me on Goodread, you'll see all the books, but I, I feel like people that are stretching outside of the norms that are tapping into wisdom. That's not common that mm. are getting comfortable in the uncomfortable that are trying to do things that people have never even heard to do before. Those are people that inspire me. And I have all of the books I've read on, on Goodreads. You can check that out. 
And I think I follow like you, I do a lot of meditations. Uh, mm. Steve Noble is probably my favorite, but I'm also getting to this woman, Shelly, who does a lot on just Akashic records and past life regressions and yeah. all the places your soul may or may not have been. And I think for many of us, you just have to find things that inspire you and you look forward to reading or listening to, or even talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So um, through your journey, uh, you've, I'm sure, given your power away at one point or another, whether that's giving somebody else credit for your work or, or, um, you know, allowing someone to change, you know, take away your power in a meeting or in a, in an atmosphere. So can you tell me about a time that you gave your power away and then maybe another time that you stepped into your power? Well, I can give you an example of, uh, so I, I had a new boss. So they asked me to move to the next position, but I'd have to move from my home in Ohio to San Francisco to lead this team. And mm -hmm. I just couldn't do it. I had two young kids. My husband has a job, so I couldn't do it. So they brought in this gentleman to lead the team and uh, he wasn't much of a doer. He loved to sit up and just kind of watch. And so every week I had like a email that I would send out of like, what's, what's completed, what's in progress, what needs help, you know, and kind of some other questions or things. Well, he decided that he wanted to roll that up into um, another email. And at first I let him do that. And I realized that he was taking credit for all of that. It wasn't really oh, a collaboration. Wow. He was basically putting his name on it and saying, this is what my team's doing by adding like three more lines. <laughs> yeah. I was so annoyed. I was so annoyed. <laughs> I was so annoyed by him about how his lack of participation or even really his own thoughts, it just was so aggravating. So I just started another email. And I just started sending it out too. And he said, you can't do that. I'm like, I'm going to, because it is clear that you're continuing to take my work as your work, which is not the case. And I need to keep my, I've been at the company a lot longer than he was at. And I just was like, no, no, I'm not mm -hmm. giving you my work. And so I just started sending it out on my own. Yeah. Yeah. Good for you. Good I'm for like, you. he had nothing he could really do. I mean, our boss could say something, but I'd be like, no, no, mm -hmm. fire me because I was the producer. So right. I was like, I don't give a shit. I'm putting this out there under my name because it is my work. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, good for you. Good for you. Yeah. A lot of people, uh, you know, we, we allow that to happen to us. And then, you know, somebody else is taking credit for our work, our thoughts, our contributions. And then it, it undermines us, you know, when we come back later and say, you know, this is what I want to contribute. They, they think, well, you know, you're piggybacking on somebody else's and, and that's not the case at all. You know, so no, present your own work. That's how mm -hmm. I say it. People say, give me the data to roll it up in my slides. Be like, no, I'd like to present my own slides. Thanks. Yes. Good for you. Good for you. So what advice would you give to your 18 year old self? Enjoy it a little more. I was so yeah. headstrong, so driven. I just wish I would have enjoyed my life a little bit more because I've been so busy trying to get there, wherever there uh -huh. is. Right. And I just wish I would have had a mentor in my life that would have just given me advice to say, you know what, just enjoy it. Take a yeah. little more vacation time. I feel like that's mm -hmm. coming around now for me, but I did work so, so hard. And I don't know in hindsight, if I had to work that hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know that that would have been mine too, is just enjoy life. Enjoy life a little bit more than yeah. you do. Yeah. Cause I, I feel like I'm constantly climbing too. And I don't even know what I'm going to be reaching when I get there, but I guess I'm, there's, it's an endless journey. Um, so when you were transitioning from technology into entrepreneurialism, running a business, writing books, what obstacles do you feel were the most challenging and taught you the most? Oh, I got a lot of no's. I mean, I mean, just be honest, like a lot of, even my last book, even though I have sold thousands and thousands of copies of my first two books, I got a ton of no's for my third book, like six yeah. of them. Wow. And they said, well, this is not a business book. This is not a spiritual book. We don't know where to put it. I'm like, it's a bridge book. It's a book that helps people create more connection to themselves so that they can balance out the feminine and masculine in the workplace. But I think it's like beyond where we're at yet as an organization yeah. or like as a community. So like nowhere to put it. Yeah. So yeah. I, um, I am publishing it under my own publishing label because I figured if it's that hard for other people, for me to get published, it's going to be hard for other women to get published. 
And I just sat on it for like a year and a half. I haven't done anything with it. And in the last eight weeks, people have come to me like, can I get my book published? You know how I can publish my book? Where mm-hmm. do I find it published? And so now I'm working on really building out this publishing arm more because I just want more women's voices in the marketplace. I just think it's absolutely a highway crime that the more that more most of the published books are published by men. Yeah, exactly. Well, it's <clears throat> funny you say that because I, I was looking at the Ted Women is coming to Atlanta. And the very first ad I saw for Ted Women was a man who was a the key one of the keynote speakers. And it was just hysterical to me that this is the advertisement that they're putting out for Ted Women. Like all these outstanding women out there. And this is why I started this podcast, because women's voices are not being heard, right? And so it really bothers me that, you know, we're still defaulting to getting all of our guidance from men and women have so much to contribute but their voices are just not being they're they're not being heard and so I started the podcast to feature women and you know I look at Ted Ted women and I'm excited to go to this convention or this conference and I look and their their very first advertisement was a male speaker that they were uh, promoting about diversity and I'm, th- I'm thinking it's ironic but um anyway so uh so tell me uh one more thing um i think you've been an amazing guest and i think that you have so much to contribute and i i think that your work on mindfulness is going to be really powerful for a lot of people so what do you wish more people knew oh i say this a lot because it, there's two things one i say get rich from the energy you create oh i like that it's amazing when you focus on energy and you focus on keeping your energy high you only attract people mostly with high energy and like life changes for you your outlook changes and then as i mentioned before you really got to focus on having gratitude and really keeping that inner voice in check so mm-hmm. that you're not drowning in negativity which a lot of us do unbeknownst to us And the second thing that I always say to myself, no matter what it is, whether my son just broke his knee. So like, whether it's that, or I don't get something I thought I really wanted to align to is this is happening for you. This is happening for you because I always just be like, I can't believe this is happening to me. And it's such a victim mindset. And if you realize that the universe is co-creating with you and this is happening for you, you just then say, okay, what is the lesson? Why is this happening for me? What do I need to learn? Where do I need to be right now? And those two shifts, higher energy, this is happening for me. I feel that the whole outlook of my work has changed. Wow. I love that this is happening for me. Yeah. That's a really, really powerful statement. And I think if we can just change the narrative in our own minds of, you know, instead of happening to me, it's happening for me. I think it could be life-changing. I think it is. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much, JJ. I really appreciate it. It's been such a pleasure to talk with you. And I already feel like my energy is a little lighter. So this is great. (laughs) So Well, thank you. This is so great. And keep it up. I think your work's amazing. And I just keep having the conversations because we all need them. Absolutely. So how can people find you and especially your publishing? So I oh, think yeah. Maybe. So the publishing is together. We seek publishing. I'm just getting that off the ground, but LinkedIn's a great place. JJ D Geronimo. You can look up JJ seeking and the number 74. You'll find me that way too, for my new book. Uh-huh. But I feel like it's just a magical time. There's a lot of amazing things happening and we are going to raise the feminine mm-hmm. energy. Absolutely. We are going to raise it. And the world will be a better place for it. Well, thank you so much, D. G. G. Excuse me, J. J. D. Geronimo. <laughs> I wanted to I wanted to combine all the letters. Um, so J. J. D. Geronimo. Um, you can also find her on prettypowerfulpodcast.com. So thank you so much for joining me again today, and I really appreciate it. And I'm looking forward to hearing a lot more about the great things that you're doing. Oh, thank you. All right. Well, everybody have an amazing day and we wish you um, good energy. And, and light. So thank you so much. Have an amazing day. Thank you for joining our guests on the Pretty Powerful Podcast. And we hope you've gained new insight and learn from exceptional women. Remember to subscribe or check out this and all episodes on prettypowerfulpodcast.com. Visit us next time. And until then, step into your own power.